Hi and welcome to the latest episode of Innovation Deciphered. On today's episode I'm joined by Mark McBride Wright who's the CEO of Equal Engineers and today we'll be delving into uh, a big topic uh, which is very uh, relevant nowadays uh, equality and diversity and also how that affects potentially mental health particularly in the construction industry so I hope you enjoy this episode enjoy well hi mark hello nice to be here thanks for yeah well thanks for coming on the podcast today pleasure it was nice to get the invite when we met a few few months ago. we did we were up just for a viewer's sake we met at Taylor Woodrow's EDNI event. Yeah, what, what with the new civil engineer. New, with the new civil engineer. Yes, yeah. yeah, plug the new civil engineer. Yeah. I've been reading it for forty odd years. Wow. <laughs> anyway, that was a fascinating event, and really, I thought well, you'd make a fantastic uh, podcast guest. Thank You've got you. a very interesting story to tell on an important subject. So, Mark, just to get everyone going, uh, tell us a bit about your personal journey, because I know. We have one thing in common, we both were at Imperial College, me oh. a thousand years ago. Right, I thought you were at UCL. Oh, so well, there's some affinity bias we can play off here, yeah. Um, sure, so I'm, I'm a chemical engineer by background, specialised in health and safety. So I did my undergraduate in chemical engineering at Imperial. So I moved to London, bright eyed, 17 year old, 2005, um, and did four years. Um, in my undergrad and loved it so much that I stayed there a bit longer to do a PhD in carbon capture and storage. Um, so yeah, my background's very much in the energy sector, working in chemical engineering, specifically in safety engineering. So when I finished at Imperial, I um, did not want to stay in academia. Uh, I moved into in industry and got a job, not far from here actually, as a safety consultant at ERM. And then decided I wanted more experience, facilitating workshops, being essentially earning, learning my trade by yeah. typing up workshops, describing workshops. So I got a job at an engineering contractor um, and then it was brilliant because I was in the concept design phase of um, engineering. So the projects I was working on were very quick turnaround, six weeks maximum. So across the five years that I was there, I worked with loads of different clients, oil and gas, defence, construction, facilities management. So I got a really great cross-section experience of um, physical safety uh, in, the, in the workplace. So that's, that's fascinating for construction people. So they had a safety sort of expert professional mm -hmm. in a concept stage of the design. Yeah. Yeah, so I worked in, so, so the business where I worked had sort of three different units, three different divisions. I worked in the engineering construction business unit as a process safety engineer. So a lot of the projects I worked on were oil and gas, energy production, in the concept design phase. I didn't really want to work on the feed stage or the um, detailed design stage because you, you're very much working on the same thing for a very long time. Um, uh, but then I, as when the first oil and gas crisis hit, one of the many that we've had in sort of 2015, I think it would have been, um, I then moved into the government services business unit at, this, at my employer and worked on a contract for the Metropolitan Police, where I was the CDM, Construction Design Management um, Safety Professional, that would help the Met with their... Um, any remedial works that they needed to do you know, across their estate, I would sort of be the contractor helping yeah. manage that. Uh, so be the, be the principal designer, that was the official title, the principal designer, which is a role within the CDM regs, 2015, that was my job. So looking at the method statements, the risk assessments, and seeing if they were being um, abided by and were good. But it was really interesting moving from a technical role in oil and gas different legislation from the health and safety executive, etc., into a new context where safety was showing up in a different way, but still the same, you know, principles. But I, I was doing more work with the 
you know, the REBA design stages, Royal Street British Architects, the sort of 10 stages that they have through through design. So concept design shows up in a different phase yes. from what I was used to in the past. Um, so I, I had quite a good grounding in the early stages in my career from a technical perspective of the journeys that engineers and integrated teams go on to take an idea through to a building or an oil and gas platform or a tank or, you know, whatever the thing may be that, that gets designed and then created, seeing safety show up across um, multiple stages. So that's not how we came to meet though. So what, where did you go from being a pure safety engineer sure. to what you're doing now? Yeah. yeah. So whilst at my employer, um, well, when I finished my PhD, I had all this extra time and realised that I really liked um, I needed something to fill up the time. So I discovered diversity in engineering. I went to an event focused on women in engineering with the Institution of Chemical Engineers and I really enjoyed it. But I never saw anything that represented who I am as a gay man. I never saw any organisation, cross-sector organisation, looking at the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer questioning community. Um, so I mulled over this and then it, coincidentally at the same time the Royal Academy of Engineering ran an event in partnership with BP, Arup and Stonewall looking at sexual orientation and gender identity and this was the first time in my life that two aspects of my identity came together, being an engineer and being gay and it sounds a bit cheesy but to say I felt a moment of transcendence would be, would be accurate in that moment, in that room, I felt like this cannot just be another event where there's a set of bullet points in some slides that get put on a website and that's the outcome from the event. I noticed that a group of us started doing activities following the event. I created a Twitter handle. One of the, someone else at the event created a blog, being a gay engineer. So we ended up pulling our energies, to cut a long story short, we ended up pulling our energies together and went on to co-found inter-engineering to connect and form and empower LGBTQ plus engineers and supporters. So it was a not-for-profit cross-sector industry group um, and it was myself and three others that set it up 10 years ago um, and that network group grew. We had regional chapters around the UK, we ran panel discussions, we ran, we generated um, you know open source materials for people to enact cultural change in their businesses um, and that's how I earned what I call my rainbow stripes for diversity and engineering. So I did that whilst on the side of my day job as a safety engineer. Um, but it quickly became apparent that I was passionate about it and that there was a need for this. So I also saw a need to step up a level on diversity, broaden out and create a brand that would put equal focus to each strand of diversity. And that's when the idea for equal engineers came about. So that's the business that I now run. Um, seven years old and we do events, recruitment, training and consulting. And so my interests now very much lie in the grounding that I have as a safety engineer and the familiarity that engineers have in physical safety and expanding that into psychological safety. So creating safe workplace cultures where people can call out non-inclusive behaviours just as much as we're trained to call out unsafe acts without fear of retribution. So leveraging that just culture that construction companies try and foster on their site so that every stone is turned where there's a potential hazard or high risk incident that could happen. Applying that also to team dynamics, being able to um, call it out basically in the moment, in the event something happens. Of course at the extremities you've got bullying, harassment, people leaving the organisation, stuff that costs a business money. So um, that, that's the space that I play in with my thought leadership. I'm very interested in um, the framework for change for engineering um, because I still think we've got a long way to go to create properly inclusive cultures and there's, there's some other things there that kind of are indicators of that that, that I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on. Yes, because I mean, I've, as you can guess, I've spent 40 years, most of it in construction, a bit in fashion now. Okay. You know, there's two very different... What's well, good to diversify. They are very, very different culturally, and they're very different industries. 
construction and fashion are both project orientated industries. Okay. The big difference between the two, from a management theory point of view, is that construction doesn't act as its own project sponsor. Okay. Fashion usually, or brands definitely do. Okay. The supply chain obviously doesn't, but the, it, so for, and, um, and as we've mentioned, after I went to Imperial, a long time after I went to Imperial, I went to UCL, I did a, a master's degree in strategic project management, right. which is how I learned about fashion. Okay. I didn't apply it for many years, but that's the mm -hmm. first time I got across fashion to project on the industry. However, the, the, where I was going with that is I, I can remember what construction was like for me. 40 years ago, and obviously at the time I wasn't, I was still white, I wasn't bald, uh, and I was young, and there was definitely bullying cultures, normal, yeah. I'd say, um, deeply racist, uh, and uh, no one ever talked about mm. gay anything, mm -hmm. it just wasn't talked about. Yeah. Whether, whether people were, I'm sure people were there, but they kept it. They were covering, I I presume, I presume. Yeah. And so I've got a very, very long perspective on it, and I can see how things are changing. Mm -hmm. but it's, as it's been conflated with mental health, particularly amongst male mental health, which mm -hmm. has happened in the last, during lockdown, I think, was the yeah. first time I started hearing about it. All of a sudden, it's a it's completely mainstream now because it affects everybody. It's 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 getting there. I don't know if I would say it's mainstream now. Certainly, in the seven years that I've been running Equal Engineers now, a year into that journey of creating that brand that would apply equal focus to each minoritized group within engineering, um, I saw a need actually to pivot and create a strategy that would engage the majority, that would get the white, cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied, neurotypical male engineer that represents 84% of the engineering industry to be more grounded in empathy when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion strategies. And there's a reason for that, because the focus on each underrepresented group is having shallow impact. It's not leading to the real systemic change that we need to get more women into construction, to get more ethnic minority groups into construction and staying in the sector. Because if you think about when someone feels backed into a corner and they're told that they're the propagator of all these problems and all this inequity, you've had it good all these years, you know, um, people lash out. People feel afraid. They feel like they're going to miss out on stuff in this shift towards equity um, and so it's a misunderstanding and it needs to be reframed factored in on that though however engineering construction and manufacturing construction manufacturing and the process industries have the highest suicide rate have the highest suicide rate of any sector in the united kingdom statistically you're more likely to die through suicide working in those industries than a typical hazard like a drop top chip falling from height electrocution, things that, as a safety engineer, I used to spend time, money and effort helping organisations minimise, eradicate, design out, make the likelihood of that ever happening as low to zero as possible. So, if the intention of our inclusion and belonging programmes are to create that space where you can be your whole self, bring your whole self to work, if we were being successful in engaging the male majority, they would be receiving it as that and therefore being able to be open and be vulnerable about what any root causes are that are driving that high incident rate of suicidal ideation or self-harm. When I first found out these rates in 2018, which haven't changed much, by the way, since then, in fact, they've gone up in some instances, I didn't believe them. So actually, we ran our own survey at Equal Engineers called the Masculinity and Engineering Survey partnered with a student from um, the Cass Business School and we had nearly a thousand respondents and in that survey one in five engineers reported um, suicidal ideation or self-harm personally and one in five also reported losing a work colleague to suicide. We re-ran that survey three years later in 2021 
post well during the pandemic, and that number of one in five had gone up to one in four engineers who'd had suicidal ideation or self harm. So engineering has a mental health crisis. We need to be doing more on this. What other incident rates? What other um potential hazards in industry would we tolerate such a high risk profile? We wouldn't. If we discovered these things, we would be implementing strategies, using innovation to design things out, to, to create more inclusive cultures. You know, to over 700 construction workers die per year over suicide. That's two per day. Two per day. Which I mean, is, what, it, ten times or worse than the number that are actually killed on site? Exactly, exactly. So much, so much higher. So there's, fact, there's an interesting statistic I can remember from the... When, at its worst, which I think was in the 70s, when people were paid on the lump and things, mm -hmm. and the Barbican Centre was being built, I think it was a thousand deaths a year in construction. And everyone suddenly, penny dropped, this is totally intolerable. Absolutely. And now we're in the 30 to 50 range, aren't we, after mm -hmm. 40 years of effort. And that now you're saying 700... And that was of... only... So, so in my new book, Engineering Inclusive Cultures, Masculinity, Mental Health and a New Model of Safety in STEM, it's coming out in February 2024. We we'll put the uh, link in the show notes, <laughs> don't worry. We, 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 we explore this and we look at, I explore this, um, and we look at the Bradley Curve, which is a fundamental piece of safety management theory developed by DuPont, and it looks at injury rates as a function of culture, and it shows us that over time we've evolved. Industry has started doing riskier and more high hazardous operations in the last 40 odd years. But in that time, as you say, incident rates and deaths have reduced, but we're still not at zero. I mean, zero is a sort of, you're never going to have zero deaths, but it's the utopia that we keep striving to get to, to make workplaces as low, as safe as reasonably practicable. So if you think about, um, if you, I mean, you could go on the health and safety website, health and safety executive website, and just Google... Um, you know, stress at work and um, workplace stress and number of hours per year lost due to workplace stress issues. You know, stress is basically masking and covering up a whole load of other factors that's just getting recorded is that. So I don't think we actually even have the data sets that properly show the real root causes of why people are leaving businesses or leaving certain sectors. It's all just sort of wrapped up in off due to, to stress. Um, but it's one of the largest causes of um, workplace absences per year. It costs business a lot of money. So, it, so we, we need to then look back at how we build trust within our organisations, how we build trust within our teams. How do we get people to feel psychologically safe in sharing whenever uh, they're at their most vulnerable to then get the right support. You know, it might be a shift in the culture that's currently in the business. It might be exiting a really toxic, acidic manager who, you know, um, leads through power, fear and dominance. Um, pockets of that still exists, but because they bring the business in, it's tolerated. So what we've had where our industry has been quite skewed to one mix of individual, we've had this gradual normalisation of non-inclusive behaviours um, which have gone unchallenged. And what we're seeing now as we move through this 21st century, that approach and value set isn't going to cut it in the long run. The generations that are coming up now have a different um, value set, different expectations of business. And if our organisations aren't aligning with that, They'll, they'll vote with their feet in who it is that they want to work for. So, yeah, it's incumbent on multiple levels. It's, re it's really intricate and really, really connected. But it, I'm, I think it's fascinating, the opportunity. I see it as an opportunity. Yeah. yeah the, the fact that you've got some bad measurables like suicides, mm -hmm. but also there's, which is an absolute pull to do something about it. Yeah. But there's this other untapped opportunity where well, if you're only getting a, a small slice of the population who want to work or can work or feel comfortable working in that yeah. industry, then that can't be good either. No, it's not. Good. And it means, it means we're completely lacking in diversity in our design teams and in our, in our projects and in our 
like how things are done in different cultures globally, they can bring that richness into the design experience. I always say there, so I'm doing a bit of work at UCL actually as a visiting professor in inclusive engineering leadership with the students. And we're working on, there's two ways in which you can influence um, the future engineers with um, inclusive engineering design. It's the process of doing the design, so the team compositions and them getting to experience the need for diversity and inclusivity and bringing their whole selves to that design team environment, but also the output of their engineering, the stuff or services that they are designing and creating products of. So are they getting a full diversity of perspectives in, in that new, I don't know, city that they're designing or new product that they're designing for, for the end users? It's about thinking about stakeholder management. And again, it comes back to my experience in safety. In concept design, in safety, when you start having the origination ideas for, for it, you've got the most degrees of freedom to make the outcome as safe as possible because you've got less fixed things yet in the design evolution. And you want to try and make things as inherently safe as possible. You don't want to be relying later down the line on additive layers of safety, because that's where holes can creep up and yep. things can, can escalate. So if we can apply inclusive engineering design practice early on in design stages, um, then the outcomes will be much more inclusive. Think about it another way, more simply. The world, if the world had had in urban population design, if we'd had more people with reduced mobility in design teams early on, would we live, would our cities be designed the way they are now? No. You might have heard this, um, like crash test dummies are designed on a um, white male 50 odd kilogram or you know, 70 odd kilogram um, sizing. So, and they've only changed recently. So actually now, nowadays, um, women are still statistically more likely to suffer serious injury in a car impact compared to men because crash test dummies have been built on a standard white Caucasian male body type. So, so there's increased risk to women in car incidents now. It's the same with PPE. Only recently has there been a real proper concerted effort to get properly fitting personal protective equipment for people of all body shapes and sizes, and particularly women. Because women, if they wear just standard ill-fitting PPE, it doesn't fit the contours of their body because, again, it's designed for men. So what happens if you're on a construction site and there's a fire and you need to evacuate, but you happen to be in that fire zone? you're at an increased risk of suffering severe burns if you're a woman because guess what? The PPE isn't as tight and fitting to the contours of your body. It's baggy and saggy in certain areas. So, you know, the, the whole need for why diversity is important for business is not just about getting up more returns on the bottom line and having more innovation in the team. It's about having um, different perspectives at the table where this stuff doesn't get overlooked or gets challenged um, in the flow of creativity and, and discovery. We, funny enough, with this whole thing around PPE, we've got one of our fashion clients who's looking to improve that uh, at the moment. So it's very topical, very, very topical. So, Mark, you've, you've painted this amazing picture of opportunity and uh, areas for people and businesses to focus on to move us forward into the middle of the 21st century rather than stuck in the 17th century. What does your business do to enable that? So Equal Engineers helps organisations attract, develop and retain talent. And we do that through numerous ways. We run events, we offer recruitment, and we do training and consulting. So the events and the recruitment stuff are helping the brand activation opportunities. Raise awareness about the fact of what your organisation does. We've got a few events in our portfolio. We run, I founded the Engineering Talent Awards four years ago. So through that, we've platformed nearly 300 people um, who've you know, gone on and won, won accolades. 
Um, and we also run a student development programme called our Pathways programme. We've taken that through four cohorts um, and going forward we're going to regionalise it. So essentially we're pairing up engineers from industry with future engineers and then with those clients we're also offering training and consulting. So if we're doing some training on inclusive cultures and I'm talking about everything that I've spoken about in this podcast, to the engineers that have maybe been a bit ambivalent or, nah, it's not for me. Actually, they're starting to get some aha moments. They're starting to think, hmm, what's my difference? What's my diversity story? But they're also then able to be reciprocally mentored by a future engineer. So pairing up a 50-year-old white male construction manager with a 19-year-old black female civil engineering student at a former polytechnic university that relationship can just blossom and they can learn from one another's frame of reference because they wouldn't readily cross one another's paths otherwise. What we find with that is that the hearts and minds of the majority group in industry are starting to shift. They're starting to um, see the needs for this cultural stuff. And so much so that sometimes these mentors go and become sponsors they want that student that they had, that they mentored, to work for them. So they'll try and drag them through, probably a better metaphor, they'll support them through the application process because currently students from minoritised groups are not translating into employment in engineering compared to their more privileged counterparts. Whether that be lower socioeconomic compared to um, more upper class moving in, um, black versus white, there's a drop-off rate of black students moving into the industry, or um, female versus male. So there's still a lot of bias in our recruitment processes that are filtering talent out. Never mind attracting more people to consider studying engineering, I'm talking about the, people, the students that we have now who've made the conscious decision to study engineering. They're not translated and transitioning into jobs at the same rate. So, um, so that's a bit of work that we do, our Pathways programme, and then our training and consulting work. And really the impetus for writing the book um, was to, I just had so much to say, you know, um, I can't squeeze it all into all the podcasts that I do or keynotes that I give. And I, I really realised that I needed to write a book to just consolidate all my thoughts, produce some frameworks. We've got some frameworks in there that organisations can use to apply some of these learnings. Um, to just then set a baseline for, 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 for the future. But I, I'm an entrepreneur, my business is growing now, you know, there's five of us, it was just myself a year ago. Uh, and yeah, I am really excited about what, what the next decade has. Well, Mark, I'm excited for you, because uh, I think you've captured the zeitgeist, you're doing something that's really meaningful, and there's unlimited demand, I'm sure. Yeah. So, good luck with that. Thank you so Thank much. you very much for coming on the podcast, and everybody, See you on the next one. Thanks. Bye.